I invite you to take your Bible, turn with me back to the book of Amos, chapter 4, Amos chapter 4. I do want to say uh, Pastor Barbara and Linda are here and uh, with Amy, and uh, so good to have them back. Uh, I still think about you sipping lemonade on the back porch while we're laboring here, but uh, so happy for you guys. I know you're enjoying family, and Linda's sister has moved nearby since you've been away, and so it's uh, pretty neat to see how God has work things together. And then Karen uh, and uh, Roly Wetterland are with us. They uh, uh, went to Clearwater. I think I have that right, right? And uh, were with us during their college years. Good to have them back with us as well. Uh, Amos chapter 4 through 6, I titled the message, The State of the Union of a Dying Nation. Now, I've pictured your favorite president up there just to inspire you uh, this uh, morning, but it's really not about the United States today. We are going to be focusing on uh, the characteristics of a dying nation, and we're really privileged to open the Word of God, and we have here in front of us the consequences of sinful choices that were made by Israel. And if you look at nations throughout history, nations always follow the same pattern of decline. Uh, we can look at moral decline and we can look at uh, uh, the decline of a military, the decline of an economy, but ultimately it's the decline of families, the family unit, the, the leadership of, of, of men in a culture. When that begins to decline, so goes the nation. And, and we are watching that. We will see that in the scriptures this morning. And so uh, as you have the, the uh, Bible there in front of you, but I hope that you also have your notes. Just a reminder, Amos was uh, uh, living and preaching during the 8th century B.C., he was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. Now, Isaiah's ministry was focused on the nation of Judah, the southern two tribes. But it was the northern ten tribes that were the subject of the ministry of Amos, whom we have in front of us. Now, Amos is preaching to a nation whose days are numbered literally numbered. Uh, it is towards the end of Israel before the invasion of Assyria. And uh, the nation of, of Israel has already fallen spiritually because of the sins of the nation. Last week, I shared with you three areas in which Israel had sinned. One, uh, one was the injustices. They were beginning to abuse the weak and the poor. There was also gross uh, immorality that was named among the people, adultery and incest. And then there was the idolatry. Not only were they worshiping idols, but things had gone so badly that even the temple itself was neglected and the kings were sacrificing their own children to idol gods. Amos, in our study last week in chapter 3, he reminded Israel that they had been the uh, recipients of God's unusual grace and blessings. That God had given Israel his word. God had given Israel his law and his commandments. God had introduced himself as the creator. And so Israel had a great indebtedness to the Lord. And it was for that reason that God had been long-suffering and patient. And yet the fact is that the days of Israel as a nation were coming to an end. You have your Bible there in front of me, uh, in front of you. I would invite you to go back with me and look with me at Acts chapter 4. Last week, as I concluded the morning message, I quoted to you Amos chapter 3 and verse 8, where Amos is sharing why he must say what he is saying, as difficult as it was to preach. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 8, then we read, The lion hath roared, who will not fear? And then he makes the application to himself. The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? In other words, for Amos, it was an hour 
that he could not be silent. It was a time in which he knew that God's judgment was coming. And he would not be silent in such an hour of desperate need. And so as you have your Bible there, Amos chapter 4, I want to introduce you to three cultural characteristics of a dying nation. They are true of the nations and histories of the past. It is also true of our own nation, these United States. And so we're going to notice those three examples. The first is this, and it is that there was a culture of liberated, brazen women. Now you read that this morning, Amos chapter 4. Let's go back and let's look at what the Bible says here. Amos chapter 4 and verse 1. And you're going to have to, it's not on the PowerPoint right away, so you follow with me if you have your Bible there. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. And then the answer of the Lord to those kind of Bashan. The Lord God hath sworn by his holiness that lo, the day shall come upon you, that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And ye shall go out at the breaches every one or every cow at that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. You can judge the course of a nation looking at the virtue of its women. Women are the barometer of what a nation is becoming. We often say, well, as goes the family, so goes the nation. But I would assure you, as goes the wives, so goes the family. And so goes the nation. Now, what I'm sharing this morning is not to be popular with you because I could care less about that. But it is to speak that which is true. And I hope that you will open your heart to the things that not the preacher says, but the things that God says. Now, on the subject of women, women are the last bastion of goodness. In a culture. They are the wall. We look at men for leadership. But we look to the women. For the compassion. The kindness. The nurturing. They are the life givers. Of the children. They are the caregivers. Of the home. And they have a tremendous influence on the hearts and the lives of their family and their husbands. And arguably, I would say this this morning. As goes the women, so goes the home, the community, and the nation. Now, some thoughts that go with that. Amos chapter 3. Look with me again. Or 4 rather. Look at verse 1. And I want to break this down so that you understand. I'm not pulling it out of the air. This is the truth. Amos chapter 4 and verse 1 is dealing with the morality of the women of Israel. Now, I didn't call the women kind. For the word kind is cow. But I'll tell you why Amos is defining the women in that manner. Let me introduce to you this thought. Hear this word, ye cows, ye kind of Bashan. Now, where was Bashan, or Bashan, as some might would want to say? It was on the east side of the Jordan River. Now, you might remember, those of you that know the scriptures, that when the 12 tribes of Israel came for the first time to the Jordan River, Before they crossed over the second time, it was commented by some of the tribes how green were the grasses, the pastures of Bashan. They were so lush that the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said, 
to Moses, we would desire these lands for our inheritance. And so when Israel came the second time to the Jordan River under Joshua's leadership, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh reminded Joshua that Moses had said that we could have these pastures, these wonderful, green, lush plains of Bashan. As a result, the thought of the cows of Bashan were cows that were beautiful, well-fed. They were desirable of all that region. So with that in mind, and understanding the word kind is a metaphor, it is a symbol. Let's go back and read. Hear this word, ye kind, literally, you women of Bashan that are in the mountain of Samaria. And so he's talking to the women of Samaria, but he's comparing their beauty, the lushness, the, the luxury that they enjoy to these cows of Bashan. So let me keep reading. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that, the, that are in the mountain of Samaria. And notice then which three things. Which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, and which say to their masters, and literally this picture here is that is to their husbands, bring and let us drink. And so the husbands of Samaria found themselves looking after the desires of the women who were enjoying the lap of luxury. Samaria was, at that time, Israel was a prosperous nation, but they were a wicked nation. And the portrait that Amos draws, the first of three judgments, is found here. As he addresses the women of Israel. Another thought then that would go to this is this. Amos declared God's inevitable judgment. Now I want to go back and I'm going to go back and touch on this again. Look at the words oppress, crush, bring, let us drink. I believe... And generally the commentators are in agreement that these women of Samaria who were enjoying having their every need met, who were enjoying not only being served, but demanding to be served. And they found husbands who were more than willing to comply to whatever the demands of their wives were. As a result of that, to continue to pamper the women who were demanding, the husbands were in the position that to supply all the luxuries that were demanded, that they were, one, oppressing the poor. Literally taking an advantage of those who were poor, powerless, helpless. The second thing in this culture in verse 1 is that they were crushing the needy. Now, the word crush is to mistreat. It is to discourage. And so they were crushing the very ones who were in need themselves. But then we ask the question, who were the poor and who were the needy? Now, it could be economic poverty. But I would suggest to you that there's another application we could make here as well. And that is when women are demanding and pampered, the children are often neglected. Now, I grew up in the 1960s. 
And I remember the women's movement and women's rights and the demand of equality. Equal work, equal pay. And we would all agree with that. But we're not the same. Men and women are not the same. The demand for equality by the feminist movement of the 1960s has expanded. Equality for all. Equality for the homosexuals based upon their sexual preference. Equality for those in our day now based upon someone's sexual identity. You see, what was a movement in the 1960s for equality, we have seen that it has become a cancer in our culture in the 2020s. Because it's been skewed far beyond what the original intent was of the women of this nation. When I was growing up, a man could work at a factory and his wife could stay home and nurture and love and raise the children. One salary would pay for a brick home, would pay for your insurance, would pay for your food, your electricity, would pay for your water. One salary. But the movement of equality and careers in the 1960s has brought us to the point now where barely two full-time incomes can meet the needs of a family. Mothers are forced to go to work whether they want to or not because you can't live on one income anymore. So we have as a nation swallowed a lie. And I would submit to you this morning that the ones that are oppressed and the ones that are crushed are our children. Now, am I against ladies going to work? No. But I am smart enough to step back and say, how did we go from one income meeting the needs of a whole family to two incomes can barely feed a family. How did we get there? So I'm not against women working. I have Summer Livingston back there. I'm dependent, okay? You know, we have teachers at our school. But do you understand the balance that I'm suggesting to you? There are ladies that have to go to work because they have no other choice but to go to work. But it should never be to the neglect of the poor and the needy. For our children need us more than anyone. Would you agree? Moving on. If you're here to be offended, welcome to Hillsdale. <laughs> Here's another thought that goes with that. Amos then declared God's inevitable judgment. Now he portrays a picture that is true to history. That when a nation would conquer another nation, and it was true for the Assyrians. That they would not only strip the captives to lead them away. But they would actually put hooks in their noses or in their ears. One bound to another and lead them away. And so God's judgment against Israel... Is being foretold by Amos. It is inevitable, ye cows, ye women of Bashan, that you will be led away with hooks and your children will be led away with fish hooks. Another thought that goes with that, verse 3. And ye, women of Samaria, shall go out at the breaches, literally the breaks in the wall, every cow, every woman, at that which is before her, 
and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Not only, not, not even the walls of the city would protect the families from God's judgment. The first consequence of a nation that is dying is when its women become loud and brazen to the neglect of their families. The second thing is found in Amos chapter 5. And it is a culture of lawlessness. You have your Bible again. Amos chapter 5. I want you to look first of all at the lamentation or the heart of, of the prophet as he's preaching this message of doom. We read in verse 1, Hear ye this word which I take up against you, even a lamentation, O house of Israel. I don't, can't remember if I have everything up here. Yeah, I do. Here we go. Verse 2, The virgin of Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred. That is, only one-tenth would survive. And that which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten, a tenth, to the house of Israel. And then consider then the culture of lawlessness. The first is that the people of that culture, that dying nation, hated correction. We read in Amos chapter 5 and verse 10 these words. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. And they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Let's break that down just for a moment. The gate was the place in a city where commerce was carried out. But it was also a place of judgment. And so if you had a problem with somebody or some act, uh, a lawless act had occurred, you would go to the gate. And sitting at the gate might be the king himself or it might be elders appointed by the king. And you arrive at the gate and it was just like going to a judgment hall. And there you would stand at the gate. You would present your case against whoever you have an alt with, an offense with. And as you presented your case, they would judge, if they were righteous judges, they would judge according to the law. But look at what had happened to Israel. With Israel, they hate him that rebuketh in the gate. They hate the ones that correct them. They despise them. And so we see this heart and spirit of rebellion. Another thing is that they hated the truth. Again, Amos 5.10. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. And they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. The word uprightly is integrity. And so they hated somebody that would just simply speak the truth. You know, you and I live in a culture today... The people don't want to hear the truth. They want to believe a lie. They don't want to hear what the facts are. Sometimes over the years, I've had people come to me and they want my opinion about something. And I know when I give it, they're probably not going to like it. And so I, I'll tell them, I'll tell you, but you're probably not going to like what I'm going to say. Because the truth is sometimes difficult to accept. Another that we find here as well is that they oppress the poor and they enrich themselves. Let's read Amos 5 and verse 11. For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor. Now we're talking about the leadership of Israel. You are treading on the poor. You take from him burdens of wheat. So here's what was happening in Israel. The richer, the ones in power, the ones in authority, were oppressing the poor. How were they doing that? Taxes is a big way to do that. I go back to my opening illustration. When I was growing up in the 1950s and the 1960s and even into the early 1970s, one income could take care of a family. You say, well, what has happened? It's called taxes. We're gouged. We're paying for programs. 
that do not benefit us as a people. We're living in a nation right now that has veterans homeless living on the streets. But we're paying for hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants and giving them money, giving them shelter, and giving them health care. Who's being hurt? And it's we the people. But see, this isn't the first time this has happened. This happens over and over again during history. Now, I, I want to say, so I'm going slow today, methodically on purpose. We as believers who are citizens of the United States, we have a weakness of always looking at the Scripture through our lenses as Americans. And we think that the, the future of the world rests on us. And it hasn't occurred to us that perhaps God doesn't have us in his plan for the end of time. A, a lot of us would say, well, pastor, you know, I'm just hanging on for the rapture. And I would love to see that happen today. But as a, a pastor, I'm warning you that apart from God's intervention, we're going to go through a season of persecution. It's happened in England. It's happening in Canada. And it will happen here. So well, the Lord's going to come before that. And I would say, as much as I love you, show me where I can find that. And so we need to make sure as God's people that we are not like Israel. But we also need to be able to speak about spiritual things in public places and to understand that the culture is corrupt because there is lawlessness in the land. Another thought that goes with that is this. They corrupted the judicial system by taking bribes. Amos 5 and verse 12. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe. And they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. And so the common man, the poor man comes to the gate of the city. He has an alt, an offense, with maybe someone who is richer and powerful. And he comes to seek justice. But there is no justice at the gate because the one sitting in judgment afflict the righteous, the just. And they've taken bribes and therefore they turn aside the poor. I look at our nation and I look at our judicial system. And I don't know about you, but I can't afford a $400 million fine. We're at the point that if you're not wealthy, there will soon not be any justice. But that's... The way it's always been when a nation is dying. Another thought that goes with that is this. They silenced the wise and the understanding. Here's what the Bible says. Amos 5 and verse 13. Therefore the prudent, the wise, the understanding shall keep silence in that time. For it is an evil time. There's another word that we use for silence today, and it's called censor. Censor. Facebook, Twitter, all the social media, YouTube, all of them, during the COVID crisis, what were they doing? They were censoring voices that were contrary to 
the government's line. Or lies, I could say. And so here we understand. I wanted to deal with the matter of this prudent here. It doesn't mean to be wise and understand it. And the silence means to be astounded. It can be interpreted in two different ways. The prudent could be stunned by the evil and lose their voice. Or it could be that the evil silence the prudent and the wise. We live in a culture today, let's, say, let's take the sexes, male and female. You and I biologically know there's a male and there's a female. And you can castrate a male, but it doesn't make them chromosomally less than a male. You could abuse a woman and remove her breast, but it doesn't mean that she's not still a woman. Now, we understand that's true. And yet there are aspects of our culture today that dares you to just simply speak the truth. There is no such thing as transsexual. It doesn't matter what the government says, and it doesn't matter the banner that the president carries. It doesn't matter. It is a lie. And our children are being abused. Remember, when the women are loud and brazen, the children are oppressed and crushed. Who's being crushed in our society today? Is it not the children? And then continuing with that, there's so much more I could say. But let's go to uh, another aspect, the third aspect of the culture. And so we've watched as the culture is defined by loud, brazen women. It's defined by lawlessness. And number three, it's also defined by corruption. Again, what does the Bible say? You have your Bible, uh, uh, Amos chapter Six. I invite you to turn there. And so here's the first thought that you'll see. Is that Israel's leaders failed the nation as watchmen. Here's what the Bible says. Amos 6 and verse 1. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Zion being where Jerusalem was located. And trust in the mountain of Samaria. Now who are these that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria? Which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. And so the corruption was in the leadership of the nation. Do you realize that the sworn duty of the president of the United States is to protect the sovereignty of our nation from invaders, from enemies? That is his sworn duty. That is his primary responsibility, is the security of our nation and the security and the safety of our households. It is, it is the primary covenant that House of Representatives have, that the Senate has with us. It's, it's the covenant that the governor has with the state. It's the covenant that the sheriff's department has with we, the citizens. But what happens when there's not a watchman at the gate? When there's no one that is, is sounding the alarm? Instead, they're saying, we're at ease There's nothing to worry about here. You're only $33, $35 trillion in debt. You're you're bankrupt as a nation. But don't worry. We'll just print more money. But as that's happening, what's happening to us? Houses are doubling in cost. Food prices are nearly doubling in some instances. Gas has gone up more than a third. We're being crushed by policies that are not for we the people. But this is what happens when a nation is dying. 
Here's another to consider with that. Amos uh, chapter 6 and verses 2 and 3. And verse 2, you have named major cities, capital cities, strongholds. And those strongholds are used as, a, as an example by Amos, speaking on behalf of the Lord. And he asks the question, Israel, do you think you're better than these kingdoms? Do you think your, what's the word, border is greater than, or their border was greater than your border? In other words, if these three cities have fallen, what makes you think that you, Israel, will not follow the same way? And then look at verse 3, ye that put away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near. You see, there were some saying it won't happen to us. I mean, after all, we're God's chosen people. We're Israel. Surely the Lord will come and help us. But instead, the Lord removed his blessing and his protection. And Assyria assailed the walls of Samaria. And the very women that had been loud and demanding were led away with fish hooks in their mouths to be captives. Another thought that goes with that as well is that Israel's leaders were also self-indulgent. They failed as watchmen. Number two, they were self-indulgent. Not all of these verses are on the PowerPoint, I don't believe, but let me give you some of them. Let's look at the self-indulgence of the leaders, verse 4. That lie upon beds of ivory. That's the picture of luxury. They stretch themselves upon their couches. And so we have in this thought, they reveled in their wealth. But also... They indulge their appetites. Look at the last part of verse 4. And they eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. In other words, their appetites were for what? Rich foods, tender meats. Let the people eat whatever. But we, the leaders, we're going to eat the lambs and the calves. They were self-indulgent in verse 5. That chant to the sound of the veal and they invent to themselves instruments of music like David. A culture that had time for amusement. Another thought that goes with that as well. In verse 6, they drink wine in bowls, not cups. And they anoint themselves with cheap ointments, with expensive perfumes. But they are not agreed by the affliction of Joseph. So we, we've seen in this passage, they failed as watchmen. Number two, they were self-indulgent. Let me give you the third one here. Israel leaders were indifferent to the sorrows and the sufferings of the common man. That's why you read in verse 6 these words. But they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Who is Joseph? Joseph is a symbol for all of Israel. And so the rich were enjoying their luxuries, their beds of ivory. They were enjoying their choice meats. They were drinking wine from their bowls. And they were giving no thought to we the people. And what they were suffering. And then I want to continue with this thought. Because it would be horrible to send you away with depression today. So I went to Hillsdale. How did you enjoy it? I left depressed. So let me give you the good news, okay? And it is this. There was hope. There was hope if the people turned from their sins to the Lord. And so even in the darkest hour, even in the last days, the last years leading up, even with all the abuses of the leaders and the neglect... God still appealed to the people through the prophet Amos. And he says there's still hope. Let me give you the reason for that hope. Here's the first one. That the Lord promised Israel. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel. Seek ye me and ye shall live. In the darkest hour that Israel would face before Assyria began to totally annihilate the people. They were still given the invitation, seek the Lord 
Turn to the Lord. Let, let me give you some thoughts with it, the thought of the seeking. What does it mean to seek the Lord? It means to seek Him in His revelation of Himself. If you and I want to have hope in the darkest hour, it is that we seek the Lord and we search His Word for the truths that He has given us. And so this wonderful promise, seek ye me and you shall what? You shall live. But then he goes on to, uh, well, it's not on my PowerPoint, but on verse 5, you can see he mentions uh, Bethel, uh, uh, Gilgal, uh, Beersheba. But seek not Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor uh, to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall go into captivity, Bethel shall come to naught. Those were cities that had been places of worship for God's people, but they had become places of idolatry. And so the Lord says, seek me and you shall live. But he negated any thought of seeking anywhere else for where the Lord could be. Again, verse uh, five, uh, 6. Seek the Lord and you shall live. Lest he break out like the fire in the house of Joseph and devour. And so it's either you seek the Lord or you'll suffer judgment. And sadly, understand everything we've read this morning about judgment. It came to pass because Israel did not repent. Our United States, unless we seek the Lord, we will go the way of all nations before us. And so seek the Lord in His Word. Take your children and teach them the Word. Because without the Word of God, they will have no hope. But there was hope if the people would seek the Lord. Here's another that goes with that. Amos exhorted Israel, notice, seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so we, we have this, this drama of what do I seek? The evil would be that which the world has to offer. But the good is that which God offers and so there was hope, but only if you seek the Lord and you will live. There was hope, but only if you seek the good and not evil that you may live. Let me continue with that thought. Romans 12 and verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What does it mean to seek the Lord? It means to seek Him in His revelation of His truths. But it also means that I seek the good and not the evil. In order to do that, I must choose to be a living sacrifice Holy, acceptable to God. Another thought as we draw near the close here. Was hate the evil, love the good. And establish judgment. Now let's break that down real fast. Hate the evil. So here's the question for us today. What is your attitude toward the world? Towards the sins of the world? Towards the amusements of the world. What is your spirit about evil? Now here's something I would challenge you. What is it that makes you angry? Now think about that for a moment. When you look at the wickedness of society around us. Does it stir you to be angry? And if not, why not? You see, I believe, and I don't have a phone here. I believe all these gadgets that we have, all these electronics. I believe all these electronics are desensitizing our culture. I think it's having an effect on us mentally and emotionally. I think it's lowering our resistance 
to that which is evil. And so the challenge here is hate the evil and do what? Love and cherish the good. But then there's a third part here. Establish judgment. Where? In the gate. You know what that means? Insist on justice. Demand justice. Do that which is right and expect it of others. And then the thought that I would put with that as we close is Romans 12 and verse 2. We know that the culture is bent on to do that which is evil. But we're to hate it. We're to despise it. When we see the abuse of children, we believers should be angry. When, when we see the, uh, abuse of, let's say, women in this culture, and I think they've been dreadfully abused. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example. Equal rights. And so now we have men claiming to be females who are competing against women in women's sports. Does that sound just to you? Is it equal? Here's a better word. Is it right? Why don't we get angry? Is it because we've become assimilated emotionally, if not spiritually, in the culture? And so we're challenged in this verse, and be not conformed to this world. Don't let it put us in its mold and shape us and, and tell us what to think and how to think. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed, say it with me, by the renewing of your mind. Now, here's a question. How do I, as a believer, renew my thinking? And you know what the answer goes back to? It goes back to the Word of God. And be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that. What's the word? Good. An acceptable and perfect will of God. That is my challenge today. This message is unlike anything I think I've ever preached. Slow and methodic. But it is a challenge to you about the state of the state of the union. We watched on Thursday as our president championed abortion and the whole democratic party stands and they cheered like they had just seen a touchdown and I'm sitting there as a pastor thinking they are applauding murder of the unborn But were you angry? I, I listen as he championed transsexuals. And I believe that it's a mental illness. It is a delusion. Because of a lie. Oppressed by a culture. That will crush children and we the people God's people we know better and we must speak out is it too late for America no but the only hope is if we the people bow our knees seek the Lord Hate the evil, seek the good, and God promises, and you shall live. Let me ask you this morning, what are you seeking? Because the days ahead are going to be evil. And we as God's people have to determine, will I seek the Lord in his word. Will I hate that which is evil? And will I seek that which is good?
as I prepared the message this Sunday, I thought about our young people, and I'm going to stop the PowerPoint there. My longing that we would have young men and young women in this church that will defy the culture, that will hate evil, and determine in their hearts, we will seek the good. We'll not be numbered among those who sit at the gates and they take bribes and then they hurt the ones that come looking for justice. But instead, we'll be numbered among those that establish judgment. Whether it's at school or it's at work, it's in church, in an HOA, that we won't be silent when somebody needs to speak the truth. So I'm asking you this morning an unusual challenge. But how many of you this morning are in God's word daily? And you would say, you know what, preacher? Maybe I'm not in it as much as I should be. But I've learned today that I must seek the Lord. And the only way you're going to do that is in his word. It's a wonderful thing to come to church and, and have a preacher get you angry, maybe. But it's a righteous thing to say, I will seek the Lord. I will seek that which is good and I will hate that which is evil. Will you do that today? Will you today, in your heart, I'm not asking you to stand or even raise your hand right now. But do you not see that the hour is late? And that judgment is coming. And we can choose to seek the Lord. Seek the good and hate the evil. Heads bowed, eyes closed.